Are you all ready? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dirk Alborn. Thank you. All right. You guys are ready for the weekend? I am. Okay, so, whoop. That shouldn't happen. Try again. There you go. All right, so yeah, basically we're transforming transportation at the speed of sound. Sounds amazing, doesn't it? So who here actually knows what the Hyperloop really is? All right, I'll test you guys later. I'll see if... Um, that's true. For all the others, we have a video that um, I like to show just because it shows a little bit how it all started, um, where are we now, where it's going. So enjoy. Let's see if the audio works. Doesn't. Let's try again. America's always been a nation of doers. We build things. We take risks. And we believe that if you have a good idea and are willing to work hard enough, you can turn that idea into a successful business. Billionaire philanthropist Elon Musk has hinted at a new high-speed transport system that could put planes and trains out of business. I have a name for it, name for it which is called the Hyperloop. So what's Hyperloop? Mr. Musk's plan? Move people using a massive vacuum tube combined with a magnetic levitation system. Kind of like a Jetsons tunnel. It's something like that, yeah. Here's how he teased the idea in May at an All Things D conference. It's a cross between a Concorde and a railgun. It's called the Hyperloop. It's a system of giant suspended tubes. Riding within are capsules carrying people or freight traveling on cushions of air at speeds of up to 1200 k's per hour or roughly one kilometer every three seconds. A tube that would be on pillars from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and inside there would be capsule cars that would be rocketed forward up to 700 miles an hour, and that there would be a fan on the front. Elon Musk basically says that this is the way of the future. How would you like something that uh, can never crash? Um, it is immune to weather. It goes uh, three or four times faster than the, the, the sort of bullet train. And it would cost you uh, much less um, than, than an air ticket. It will only cost to build this six or seven billion dollars. Oh. Compare that to the 65 billion for the current high speed rail plans for California. He believes this is a viable, valuable alternative for mass transit between these two destinations. Could something like the Hyperloop actually be the answer to super fast, environmentally friendly, high speed travel between our busiest cities? So the gauntlet has been thrown down. A design document for a whole new super cool way to travel. The only thing now, will someone pick it up and make the Hyperloop a reality? There are some companies that, have, that are forming to try to make the Hyperloop happen and uh, I encourage them, I think that's, that's great. Um, I'm super focused on Tesla and SpaceX and to, to you know, a small amount on Solar City, so that, that basically completely uses up my, my brain. Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop, and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. The only resistance would be the air in front of the capsule, which uh, we move to the back by using a compressor. The company Hyperloop has teamed up with the students to create this tube technology that's designed to connect cities up to 400 miles apart. Dirk Alborn says it's safer and more efficient than the railroad. 
Well, the system is complete, completely computerized. So um, you, know, you optimize the system and then you actually have the humans to monitor it. In railroads, most accidents were all human factors. Plus, a lot of the derailments actually happened because something's on the track. So we're in a closed system. We're completely managed by a computer system. There's no human factor that can actually create those issues. We actually plan on uh, seeing the first Hyperloop very, very soon starting. Can you imagine uh, and walk us through what it might be like to travel at the speed of sound? It's not going to be much different than uh, sitting in an airplane, actually. Obviously, for us, it's very important to make it as good of an experience as possible. So This is an independent organization that has formed. We have 170 engineers, scientists, and uh, really great professionals with amazing backgrounds. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods, known as the Hyperloop, is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5, with construction set to begin in 2016. Let's bring in Dirk Alburn, who is the man who runs the Hyperloop Transportation Technologies team, which is announcing this deal with Quay Valley, California. Uh, Dirk, tell me about this deal and, and really when you expect this Hyperloop, this five-mile stretch to be finished. Quay Valley is supposed to be breaking ground um, beginning of 2016. That's um, when we will be start um, working on our development. So we will be starting ground uh, at the same time. Uh, we, at this moment, we expect to be done by 2018. Hyperloop now appears one step closer to reality. Starting next year, that theory will turn into a groundbreaking in Quay Valley, Kings County off of I-5. A developer there has just committed a big chunk of his private land toward the project. It's a five-mile loop that would take visitors through a planned entertainment district. There's going to be a test track. Elon Musk has announced that he's going to build a small-scale test track. It's a necessary step for us to be building a full-scale version, and um, Quay Valley is a sustainable model town of the 21th century, so it's a perfect fit. They're expecting over 10 million uh, visitors per year, so we will actually be able to re uh, generate revenues very, very fast. The company plans to go public later this year. We want to do a public offering. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. We want to make sure that um, the people that have been helping building um, the company and this technology are able to um, participate in, in, in the investment and the fundraising and the upside of the company. With their contributions to Hyperloop, these students from around the world now have stock options in the company, but they say they're not in it for the money. As a student, I start to feel like um, I'm in, a, in part of a, some great career that might change the world. Will the Hyperloop kill the railroad? The Hyperloop is going to do to the U.S. what the railroads did in the 1800s. So um, it will change the way we live. It's possible today. It's based on existing technologies. And it's the right time, it's the right moment to finally get something doing like this. Is it visionary? In 30 years' time, <laughs> will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then, and he did it. Do so you think this is possible? This is not just? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. For all those who said this is just a neat little thing <laughs> to draw on a cocktail napkin, these guys are saying it will become reality. All right, so those were basically two and a half years put together in five, six minutes. Um, so just to reiterate, what is a Hyperloop? So imagine a capsule filled with people hovering inside a tube, moving really, really fast from point A to point B. There you go. The capsule doesn't touch anywhere. In fact, we developed together with one of the leading national research centers, Lawrence Livermore Labs, a technology that they had developed before for over seven years. And it's a passive magnetic levitation technology. So basically, the capsule doesn't need any power to levitate. It levitates through the motion. This has the advantage that it's um, much safer in case of a power failure, for example, the capsule doesn't just crash down. Um, but only once the capsule is much slower, it finally gently touches back. It's much cheaper because you don't need high power station all around. And it's very, very comfortable because you actually have a track. We also 
developed a new material. It's a composite material that has smart capabilities. We call it vibranium. Some of you, I mean, who is a geek like me knows vibranium, Captain America, the shield. So there was inspiration here. It's a material that protects people, right? So what we're doing is um, we're, when we manufacture the capsule, sorry, there you go. When we manufacture the capsule, we use a two-layer approach. It's basically a sandwich with an outer vibranium skin and an inner vibranium skin. This has the advantage that if something happens to one of them, you still have the other one that keeps you safe and keeps you inside the pressure, pressured uh, environment. Right? And we can, because it's a smart material, it will actually tell us if it's healthy or not, which allows us to take the capsule out of circulation, should they even be the smallest problem in the structure. Inside the tube, we create a low pressure environment. So basically, we take all the air out. We do this so that the capsule, very similar to an airplane that goes into high altitudes, can travel really fast with very little energy, because it doesn't encounter any resistance. The whole system is on pylons, which has the advantage that we only need to buy the land where the pylon sits. We don't have to buy all of it. right? So it's cheaper again. If you own the land where we're building a Hyperloop, you'll be happy because you can still get to the other side. Because today, when they build a freeway, a highway, a rail, they actually don't care how you get over there. They tell you, well, you figure it out, or maybe switch with your neighbors. The problem is neighbors don't only get along, not always get along, right? So it's a huge issue. But it also allows us to integrate the latest earthquake technologies. So that this system is actually much, much safer in an event of an earthquake than anything that would be on the ground. Capacity is something that comes off often. With one tube, we can substitute air travel between Los Angeles and San Francisco five times. And we have two. But even if anything would happen and we would need more capacity, which we obviously like because we're, it's a business for us, right? So we would make more money. We're over-engineering the pylons to be able to add on more tubes. This is a very, very early concept, but it just shows how those things can be done. This is a, probably the most important part. It's completely green. And it's not important because we are good people, but it's important because it's a big part of our business model. Okay? So we're using solar, wind, kinetic energy through regenerative braking, and in some cases, even geothermal, to produce more energy than we're actually using. Why is this the most important part? Well, there's basically no rail, no metro in the whole world that's making money. They're all losing money. They're all heavily subsidized by the government. We, because we produce more energy than we're using, have very low operational costs. So with a $30 ticket price between Los Angeles and San Francisco, we would be profitable within eight years. And that's a first. But why should we actually do this? This is why. Traffic. Terrible. I don't know how bad Utrecht is, but this is where I come from basically every single day. So traffic, in fact, I mean, we sit hours of our lives in traffic. We waste time that um, could be productive. But more importantly, we, we waste time that, where we could be with the people that we love. 
actually, it's so important that based on where we live, we decide where, we, where to work, right? Based on where we live, we decide who to date. Because if she lives on the other side of the city, it's probably not going to work out. But then there's this. I don't know who here enjoys traveling. I don't. I, I think traveling sucks. It's terrible. It's a terrible experience. And I've met some people that told me that, you know, it wasn't always like that. At the beginning, it was actually fun. You travel for the experience to be on the road. Well, I mean, today we are treated like animals in airports. And it might make you even more angry when I tell you that all those safety measures that you see in the airport, they don't work. If you Google, you'll see that it's fairly easy to get around them. They're just there so that you feel safe, which is an important aspect, but, you know, it's not a great pleasure. This is another reason. Beijing on a sunny day. On a bad day, you don't see the hand in front of your face. So pollution. And now you might think, okay, well, China, yeah, they're terrible. But this isn't a problem that we have only in China or Mumbai. This is a problem that we have everywhere. In fact, here in Europe, where you live, you probably, on average, lose 14 months of your life thanks to pollution. So think about what you could do with 14 months. Because that's the time that we take away from you. Now, given traffic is not the only thing that creates pollution, but it's for sure a part of it, and um, we should do something about it. Well, then there's this. The train industry is a dinosaur industry. It's literally old. Hasn't innovated in probably over 100 years. We're building old systems that are expensive, rather than taking some money of that to develop new ones that can be much cheaper and to solve a lot of more problems. This is a distance between the rails. Who here knows? Why? Nobody? Huh? You have seen the presentation. Have you seen the presentation before? You're from Spain. Si, si, si. Justo. It's a Roman carriage. This is how we built today trains. Actually, only Spain and France on the high-speed rail have made it a little bit larger. So basically, based on the butt of two horses, that's what he said. That's how today we're building new infrastructure, just to give you an idea. But if we would take those rails and what we would make them larger, we could now actually move more freight, more people, faster, and more important, safer. But we, are not, we don't. Then there's this. As I said earlier, there's not one metro, one rail line in the world that's profitable. To give you an example, the Los Angeles metro makes 76 cents per passenger. And taxpayers are paying $2.50. But it's not only LA, because people can say, well, everybody drives the car in LA. New York, which is probably the busiest metro in the world, loses $2.2 billion a year, 82 cents per passenger. And, well, you know, it's actually all over. Germany, I think, has $9 billion in subsidies per year for their rail system. I have no idea how much the Netherlands have, but believe me, it's a lot. So, but how would our lives be if we would have a Hyperloop? Well, there's a couple of other problems we didn't really talk about, but airports, for example, are overfilled. We're building more, more and more airports. 
We are, they are fairly close to the city, right? We need to connect. Now, with the Hyperloop, these airports could actually become terminals. They're not single airports anymore, they're connected. They could also be much further out. Ships, ports, prime real estate. Ports could be outside of the city, in the water. And containers could be unloaded in real time. There's a huge opportunity also for transportation of goods from China to Europe, for example, not in months, but in hours. We could live where we want. You could live in one city, work in the other. You could maybe live 150 kilometers, 200 kilometers outside of a city and still be in the city center within 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I mean, to buy a house where you don't have the probability to get shot in Los Angeles, you have to spend roughly a million dollars. And it's not a pretty house. But you could create a new area, a new city, basically. You buy it fairly cheap. And now, just when you announce a project, the real estate value will go up. And already with that difference, you're able to finance a construction. But how are we doing this? Well, we know we can build pylons. We have done this quite often. If you look around, they're everywhere. We also know we can build tubes. We know we can create a vacuum inside a tube. This is a picture of the CERN Hadron Collider in Switzerland. Actually, the tube diameter is exactly the same as ours. The pressure is much, much lower. And the company that is working on maintaining this vacuum is actually part of our team. So when we talked to them about our project, they were smiling, because for them, it's actually fairly easy. So we have the technologies. Alternative energy is a great choice. Why? Because just like uh, Moore's law, it continues to become better and cheaper every single year. So our business model, which is based on the fact that we're producing enough energy to actually produce more than what we're using, will only look better in two, three, four, five, ten years. But in order to achieve this, we had to do things a little bit different. And this is the part that I'm personally I'm most passionate about. So I'm sure you all are familiar with these companies. They have all something in common. Actually, you're pretty young. Is there anybody here who doesn't know one of the companies? Which one? You don't know Polaroid? You don't know Polaroid, Kodak, and Blockbuster. Lucky for, lucky for Blackberry. <laughs> well, one of them invented the digital photo, which might be surprising to you because they're not around anymore, because they didn't use it. And the other ones just didn't go with time. So that's exactly the point. They're all failures. I mean, BlackBerry, some people, you know, I know they still have a chance, maybe, I think they do, but they're not acting like it. So for me, they're on there. Facebook has taken them off. I mean, it doesn't work on, 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 uh, on BlackBerry anymore, so definitely a failure. Then there's these companies. They all have something in common as well. All of these companies, at one point of their history, had to make a change and incorporated something called crowdsourcing. Some of these companies have more than 50% of the innovation coming from the inside, uh, from the outside, sorry. Lego, to give you an example, was almost bankrupt. The changed the CEO. The new CEO incorporated crowdsourcing. And today, it's one of the most successful toy companies out there. So normally, when we talk about the train, the metro, it happens here, behind closed doors. 
But in our case, we do something that we call crowdstorming. Basically, we ask you. We ask the people that are actually using it. We ask our community. We work with the general public. We do things like, uh, I mean, people can join the team, obviously. We want to hear their honest opinion. We want to hear their ideas. They reach out and help us with their connections. And sometimes they even help us with tasks. As an example, we are doing a digital innovation challenge in Bratislava on the 6th of July at the airport. And the goal here is not necessarily something specifically for the Hyperloop. The goal here is to create an ecosystem. We have realized that we can solve all the problems. But if we create an ecosystem, this ecosystem will solve those issues. It's just like your phone is not the innovation. It's the apps that are on it. So we're creating an app that's an, actually an infrastructure. It allows you it allows you to build upon the data. So people say, I want to go home. You know where they are, where they're going, when are they going to be where. They say, I want to go to LA, to the street. You know the whole process. And now you can build solutions where maybe my luggage gets delivered directly to the hotel every time I fly internationally. Or maybe only when I go, when I go home. right? And I don't have to worry and stay there and wait or maybe it's a dating service, whatever it might be. But it's, a, it's really questioning everything that we have to do. So even when we worked on the Hyperloop, when we were crowdstorming, we asked questions. We asked questions like, do we need a ticket? And not only do we need a paper ticket, but is a ticket the best way to monetize? Because if we find a better way to make money than a ticket, then a ticket becomes negative because you want people to write more. Then a ticket is only used to regulate demand. So we're actually doing studies together with universities, with MIT, and it looks very promising. Or well, things like, when I look at the cost, pylons, obviously, a big part. You see the pylons everywhere. But the moment you start and you say, hey, here are 200 pylons, they're yours. What are you going to do with them? It's only asking the question that gives you the ideas. Some crazy ideas come up, some are genius, but there are ideas. Things like, let's make them into beehives, let's use them as vertical gardens, or actually there's a scientist who told us we can store energy inside with a new material. There's my favorite, which is in technology that was developed by the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, where we're able, with the same components that we use for the Hyperloop, to create water out of air humidity. There can be electric car charging stations. There's so many things that can come up with something that normally people would say, well, we need a pylon because it holds up the tube. So it's all about asking the questions. We need to develop new technologies. We need to make the experience better. So as an example on how we make money and how to make people feel better and get, give them a better experience is the augmented windows. So we actually are developing a technology that's a screen. Right? Remember, inside the Hyperloop, you don't really have windows because you're inside a tube. But there's an, a screen, and the screen basically tracks where you're looking. And based on where you're looking, we're moving the image so that it really looks like you're looking outside of a window. The advantages here are the fact that now, I mean, imagine a metro, right, to not go too far with the Hyperloop. And now between the stations, you could be riding through Terminator land, Jurassic World. The transportation company can make money. For you guys, it's an experience. It's actually something you enjoy. And um, everybody's happy. So we're creating a new, a new way of 
making money, monetizing a new way of uh, creating content, experience content, something where you're in virtual reality in an environment without glasses. Take a look. So, but why are we doing things like this? You see, everybody thinks this was Elon Musk's idea. It's actually not true. We have been thinking about tube traveling for quite some time. I think that the first one, at least that I could find, was Jules Verne's son, who in a book described tube travel. So in 1870, in New York, there was a company that um, actually built the first New York subway, if you want so. They built a pneumatic tube that was bringing people from one station outside in a track. They, their goal was to connect New York to San Francisco underground. Um, needless to say, it didn't work out. But maybe it was just a little bit too early. The first patent for transporting people inside a vacuum tube dates back to, to 1904. Robert Goddard, who is one of the best well-known rocket scientists, came up with this concept and patented it. In 1969, the Secretary of Transportation of the United States said in an interview in Popular Science, that tube travel would change the way America lives. And they actually had two prototypes that they were financing at that time. Then there was the Jetsons. In the 90s, the, the Swiss tried. There was a project called Swiss Metro. It was tunnels underground with a maglev train. Actually, technologically, completely sound. I think they had some cost issues and we're still in development, and the government stopped the project. Then there were the Simpsons. And then there was Elon Musk. So when Elon Musk came out with this concept, I was part of a nonprofit incubator that was funded by NASA. And we were working on a new way to build companies. You see, you do everything online today. You buy your groceries, you get your dry cleaning, you find your boyfriend, girlfriend online. In America, you even can get divorced online. But when it comes to building a business, it's you with a buddy and a beer in a bar. And you start talking and you decide, hey, let's get going. This is how it's done. Six months later, you realize that nobody else has the same problem or maybe advertising wasn't the best way to make money because you actually need a ton of users. And that's why companies fail. Lack of insights, lack of experience. So now imagine you would have 100, 200, 500, 1,000 people that have the same passion you have, that give you their honest ideas, their the, the ideas, sorry, their honest opinions, help you with tasks, you could build a better company. 
you're not stuck with working with a local engineer, mediocre. You can work with the best person that's passionate about your project in, in Japan, right? And you would be surprised how many people are actually passionate about the same thing you are. If you Google any idea, there's probably already two or three that are working on the same one. So why not work together? So we launched at the same time in beta. And so when Elon Musk said that he didn't want to do it, he wanted someone else to pick it up, that he was too busy with Tesla and SpaceX, we reached out and um, asked for permission to put it on the platform. Then we asked our community, should we be working on this? Not only did they say, yes, you should be doing this, but they said, hey, I want to be part of this. I want to work on this. So we incorporated the company, got a small team together, and said everybody who would like to join and work on this in exchange for stock options with a minimum of 10 hours per week, please apply. We got 200 applications, got a team together of around 100 engineers, and said, we don't know if this works, let's try. And we're working on a feasibility study. We finished the feasibility study at the end of 2014. And since then, we're now 520 people Actually, we're growing constantly, plus roughly 40 companies, and some of them are Fortune 500, so the biggest ones in the field, like Ehrlichon Leibold, the inventor of the vacuum pump. We realized that to make this happen, we had to not build a company, but we had to build a movement. We had to do it in a different way. Because all these projects that you have seen earlier, they all tried, but they're all depending on one country, on one location, on one company. And this is a huge project. This is a project that depends on infrastructure. You work with governments. Um, you know, if you want to do something like this in the US, it's probably going to take very, very long. And I said the same thing about Europe, but we're actually now moving forward in Europe. But for sure, the prime markets are Asia, the Middle East, Africa. So, after we announced the feasibility study, now there are other companies that are trying to do the same thing. There are, is a SpaceX competition with a university here in Delft, which is great. So why I'm telling you this? Well, first of all, if you want to join the team, I want you to join the right one. But I also think it's super interesting because especially with the other companies, it's great to have them there, right? Because you don't never want to be the only one. It, part of a movement is also that it doesn't depend on you. So I think that's awesome. I think it's super interesting to see how the things go and work out with a very traditional approach sometimes. So the, I heard earlier a talk about startups and unicorns and that the new trend is cockroaches because cockroaches are, can survive right, and move forward and eat everything and can live without food. And that's exactly our approach, if you want so, because everybody in our company is fueled by passion. They want to make a difference. They're building value for the company. So we actually didn't go out and raise any funds. We had more than 600 investors that have come to us and wanted to invest into the company. And we've always said, not yet, we're not ready. But also we, because we want to show to you guys that it's not important to raise a lot of money, that you can do things another way, that you can go after the big things rather than trying to just do an app and make a billion dollars because Facebook buys it. So that's, for me, personally, very, very important. And the moment we need the money, it's there. Money is not a problem in this project anymore. Why? Because wherever you turn, you talk about Hyperloop now. It's real. It's there. You'd be surprised in August of 2014, so before we finished the feasibility study, there was an article saying the Hyperloop is dead. Elon Musk presented it. Nobody cares. There was a little piece about us because we actually talked to the journalists. We said, no, no, we're still working on it. We're just not ready. Nothing. 
So I think for everybody who does a startup company, and I don't know how many here are working on their own company. Awesome. So the one thing that I want to give you is ask. Ask other people. When you talk to someone and you tell your story, when you're like, hey, what do you do? And they say, wow, that's cool. Your answer should be, why don't you join me? Why don't you help me? And you would be surprised how many people are actually willing to help you out. How many opportunities are there? I mean, we, we got sponsorships from Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google, um, literally Autodesk, uh, the sort systems. You know, why? Because we ask. We say, look, we're doing things differently. We're not going to pay you a million dollars of, uh, of, uh, of licensing fees. But do you want to be part of what we're doing? Do you think that's exciting? Maybe in the future. And it works. So we have, as I said earlier, more than 520 people from all around the world. And these are not just a couple of guys in the chat room. These are really impressive people. Some of them have landed uh, the Mars rover on Mars, was part, were part of the Apollo mission. Here are just a couple of them. Educated economist. I've been working in solar energy for 15 years now. Program management, project management, and predominantly advisory for the Department of Defense. I come out of the music industry, kind of mostly known as the saxophone player with Pink Floyd. I currently teach at the University of Southern California. I wrote a book about augmented reality for marketing job. One year at CERN and three months at Spotify. And right now I'm working at Facebook. I work as a localization project manager. I'm an Emmy award-winning producer, editor, director. I'll be interning with Tesla Motors for the Thermal and Aero team next semester. I work as a product manager at Cisco Systems. All of my work is in the commercialization of innovation. I'm a product manager at the Walgensen Company. I own a firm called Open Plan Consultants in Denver. I currently own and operate my own private legal and business development consulting firm. I am currently employed by Apple. I got over 40 years in surface transportation. I'm currently a test engineer at SpaceX. I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer for Aveta Global. We are the Hypernals! We are the Hypernals. <laughs> we are so, I guess you probably didn't hear anything, but we have guys that are at Walt Disney, SpaceX, NASA, Boeing, Tesla, um, Apple. We even had one of the guys that was uh, part of Pink Floyd and Toto. So, it's not only engineers, it's all kinds of people. We have a song now, and Carmen, the top R&B band on YouTube, is part of our team. Boys Avenue, the top uh, boy band on YouTube, has over 80 million views. They want to help and spread the word. So we get five new applications every single day. And these people, when they come, we ask them, what can you bring? Then we also say, hey, can you bring any money? We never ask them for the money at the end. But it's just interesting to see what they answer and uh, how committed they are. So, here are a couple of them.
So, you know, that's the part that I find amazing. So as I said earlier, we're now moving forward into constructing, so we'll be raising money, but we promised our team that they would be the first ones that are able to invest into the company. We don't, if, I mean, it's actually easier if they don't, but out of 520 people, we had 140 that want to invest into the company. They're inside, they're working for stock options, just to give you an idea. So when you run a startup company and you have an idea and you find people that are passionate about the same things you are, and you show that you're moving forward and you work with them, money is not going to be an issue because people see what you're doing and how, you are, how passionate you are and how well you manage your business, of course, as well. So it's really not that important to right from the get-go to get those millions of dollars. But this is all fine. So when are we actually going to see the first Hyperloop, right? So we filed, well, we got actually, we got land in Quay Valley, by the way, came out of the community, five miles right next to the freeway, inside a newly to be built town in Quay Valley, Kings County, California, right in between Los Angeles to San Francisco. So next time you drive up, look on the right hand, because you're gonna see us building there. We filed the building permits, we finished the surveying and the mapping, we're doing the environmental studies, we expect to be ready to break ground later this year. Why Quay Valley? Well, Quay Valley is a model town of the 21st century. It's uh, completely cutting-edge technology, completely solar-powered, walkable. Um, but it's also an entertainment destination. It has three resorts, a theme park, a big shopping component. So we'll be actually moving 10 million people a year. So it's a revenue generator for us. But then there's also Slovakia. We signed an agreement with um, the government of Slovakia and are now moving forward in defining the best possible route. First, inside Bratislava, with a goal later to connect Bratislava to Vienna and later to Budapest. And I think this is the most important part because, you know, when you want to do these kind of things, innovation goes actually fairly fast. Regulation is what happens much more difficult. So money is not an issue, but regulations, if you really want to use it, yes. So these things in Asia, the Middle East can happen because often there's one person that decides. So for us to have, be here in Europe and not somewhere, you know, in California, because people are always, when, we, when you talk about these kind of things and you say, yeah, it's California, there's robots walking on the street and um, flying cars and things like that. Um, but when it happens in front of your home. I think that's something that I'm as a European I'm really excited about and we work with amazing engineers that we have here in Europe to make this happen. So this is normally what the answer that people should get right when they say oh but this can happen. And believe me, when we started out in 2013, we heard a lot. Still, I hear a lot. And I hear things from people that have no idea what we're even doing. But they just have some stupid comment or argument on some assumption that they're having. Um, and it's not about criticism, because criticism is actually good for us. We like naysayers. We like people that point out things and say, this is an issue. Because then we can take a look at it and we can solve those issues if they're there. But you should, if someone says this is impossible to you, you should just keep going and take, continue looking and seeing if you think it's possible and if you can solve those things step by step. Anyways, we plan on opening 2019 in Quay Valley and hopefully soon after that in, uh, in Slovakia. So you're all invited. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dirk. One more round of applause for Dirk, please. You can clap like you really mean it, like you really appreciated the presentation.